Hi everyone, I'm Russ Hamilton. I'm a retired sergeant with California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Hi everyone. So anyway, today we're going to be doing a real quick uh, video here on crime scene preservation and evidence. And uh, one of the reasons uh, that Anthony wanted to do this is just to give everybody, you know, just a quick gloss over an idea about it because some of us don't deal with uh, too much of this in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Now me, I'm no kind of expert or anything on um, crime scene preservation or collection of evidence and that kind of thing. Yet, I have been at an awful lot of crime scenes. I've preserved them. I've uh, taken, you know, evidence into the chain and stuff. And so, you know, based on that, I do have a few things to say and a few pointers that I can uh, give you on uh, making sure that you do that in the right way. Of course, uh, across this great country of ours, uh, we've got 50 different states and 4,000 something different counties. So you're going to have, you know, a lot of different uh, policy differences, procedure differences, uh, and even uh, within the law books, uh, different uh, things that you have to cater to with regard to penal code and so forth. But getting all past that, um, the easiest thing to think about is, you know, there's a few different types of, uh, of evidence. You've got your um, reports, you've got your uh, witness statements, you've got um, all of these uh, other things that are in the uh, physical realm. So it's mostly the physical realm that we're going to deal with, although um, part of the physical realm is always going to involve your reports as well, because they are evidence, in fact. So what we're looking at here is, is within your reports, I'm going to give you a few key things to watch out for, some mistakes not to make. Well, you're doing those as it relates to your physical evidence. So let's just go to your physical evidence, and um, we'll start with it right away. When you find something, wherever you find it at, it is a crime scene at that point, if it involves something that could be a misdemeanor, uh, an infraction, or a felony. And uh, depending on what department you work for, that department may want you to catalog and do all of the things with that piece of evidence regardless of whether it's going to court or not because you may you may not know at the time whether it's going to court you may not know who your suspect is you may not know if you have a victim or not if you walk into a um if you walk into a day room and there's a shank sitting there on the floor well, there's no blood on it, perhaps, but you still don't know if it wasn't used in an attack or something. So we need to treat all of this stuff as if it's a, as if it's an actual crime scene and that we may eventually have a victim. We may eventually have uh, a suspect or perpetrator at our hands. So the most important thing that I can tell you with regard to evidence is, is that you have to document it and you have to create a link in the documentation that you do that tells what you did with it. And whatever you did with it, whoever you handed it off to, um, whether you checked it into your evidence room or not, those people there, they have to create another link that tells what the final disposition is. And it all has to be an unbroken chain so that the district attorney can use it in a court of law. Because if you have one broken link, it's gonna get thrown out. That's just the way there is. So the way I like to look at it is this. I like, um, for whatever documentation that I'm doing with regard to physical evidence, to tell a story. So there's been a lot of cases where I found a weapon or I found some drugs or something like that. And basically, I'll create my little crime scene and I'll make sure that I have a camera and I'll go through and I'll have placards and I'll have the names of the people that are suspects, the names of the people that are perhaps victims. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a stabbing, maybe it was an assault or something like that on those placards so that as I'm taking pictures and stuff, the story becomes clear. And you always want to start back away from the area so you can be sure, you know, to get the area in your photograph and then work towards it. So if you're working towards an item, perhaps, maybe you'll start outside of a dorm or outside of a, a cell block, and then the next picture you'll take will be of just outside the cell, and then maybe the next one just inside the cell, and then maybe uh, down underneath the bunk. And then that way, a person's not just looking at a shank against a bunk rail and not know where it's coming from. They'll see the story, and you know, okay, picture number one up there, that's outside, you know, cell block A. Picture number two, that's a picture of the cell door and it's number 232. And then the next one is just inside the cell. And then they get a frame of reference in their head for where that evidence is coming from. 
But anyway, it's very, this is very simple stuff. I can't go into the details of everybody's specific uh, department stuff. But these are just ways to keep it in mind. So then, once you've created that story and you've collected that evidence, you're going to take it to wherever it is that you drop evidence off. Now, where I used to drop all of my evidence off was is we had an evidence room. And it was just basically a way to keep track of everything that was dropped off in there. And we would drop it off into a, a we put it in an envelope, drop it off into the shoot catalog and log everything so that we'd always have that unbroken link. And that's what's really important here is unbroken link. And then in your report, and this is generally, it depends, of course, again, from department to department, um, you're going to tell exactly what you did with that evidence and you're going to describe it. And if you created evi any evidence in the way of diagrams or photographs and stuff, you'll list each one of those. Photograph number one, give a quick synopsis. It's the outside of the cell block showing that uh, this was located in cell block A. Um, photo number two is just inside showing the outside of the cell where I found the weapon or drugs or whatever. Uh, number three shows uh, the inside of the cell. Number four shows a close-up of exactly where I found these uh, these items and they were not in situ, which means that they, which means that you removed them and took them out because you didn't know what they were at first. Or maybe they are, maybe you saw it and it was still there and you didn't mess with anything. So then it is in situ, means in the way that you found it, right? So you make a list of all those and you catalog all this stuff and you give descriptions. Um, a lot of times too, when you have a big piece of physical evidence like a weapon or something like that, um, you may want to or it may be part of your policy that you're to take it back there and you're to either tag it and put your initials and time and where you found it and all that stuff on it. Or it might be that they want you to actually take and engrave your initials on it. Well, all of that stuff has to be in your report too. I, you know, I took it back to process it in the evidence room and um, I took the uh, state issue engraver and I put my initials in it and I also inscribed uh, the date and time. Whatever it is they want you to do. Now, you can't do that necessarily with every piece of evidence. Some um, some weapons may not hold up to that. Of course, you can't do it with dope. Um, <clears throat> but the next thing I need to get down to here is the descriptions. Keep your descriptions simple. Otherwise, under cross-examination, you're going to wither. Just put down, you know, I found, I, found, uh, I found an improvised makeshift stabbing weapon, makeshift improvised um, slashing weapon, makeshift improvised impact weapon, parentheses, slung shot, if you don't know what that is, look it up. Um, things like that, just to keep it simple, because otherwise you're going to get crucified on the stand, I guarantee you. And then the next thing uh, to keep in mind is, is when you put all this in there, once again, keep it simple. Because if you go in there and you write something silly that you didn't think about, like, uh, you know, I, uh, I process this weapon into evidence per um, institutional procedure, okay? Well, what did you just do there? You just opened up a big box of worms for who? For the defense attorney, right? Because if you're up there on the stand, you go, okay, well, explain to us what this institutional procedure is. And you can't do it out of your head. And you varied in any simple way there. And then they're able to go and subpoena for the records and or the records, but not for the, your departmental operational manual. And, and you varied in any little way. It can end up to be some kind of circus, let me tell you. Okay, the next part of physical evidence that you probably won't deal with too much is forensics. And forensics has to do with things like fingerprints and uh, collection of bodily fluids and that sort of thing. Um, I never did too much of that, but there's situations that you might get into where you might have to collect a blood stain or something. Not really going to go into that other than to say you follow the same exact guidelines although most of those things get turned directly over to a lab. Uh, the one caveat here that you have to be really careful of is there's a whole big section now that has to do with Priya, and it has to do with, um, with both our victim and our perpetrator. If you have a victim, that person is going to be um, treated differently in that if they leave the institution um, to go have a medical evaluation and to have a forensic nurse collect evidence, uh, they're not going to be allowed to take a shower. They're not going to change their clothes. None of that stuff is going to ha happen. They're going to be transported as is. And the same thing goes with a perpetrator. If we have a perpetrator in some sort of rape crime, 
they're not going to be allowed to shower. They're not going to be allowed to change clothes, any of that stuff. All that stuff is going to be uh, done possibly at an outside facility. Some of you may have uh, actual forensic nurses that work and are on duty. But in any case, it's going to be up to you to collect that evidence that they present unless unless they directly submit like bodily fluids and swabs and that sort of thing. But you're still probably going to have to collect those clothes. You're still going to have to collect that evidence and you're going to have to make sure that it's an unbroken chain when you bring it back. Also, don't go out there without a change of clothes for that uh, inmate uh, victim or perpetrator to come back in. So these are just a few things to think about. Um, I'm just keeping it really basic. Um, like I said, I've collected a lot of weapons, collected a lot of dope, collected a lot of cell phones. But those things are worth treating as evidence, even if they're not controlled. Um, and let me just give you a quick example. Let's say you find an uncontrolled cell phone, and uh, you just decide that you're going to chuck it by the wayside, or you're just going to throw it in some evidence bent over at investigations, and you're not going to do the paperwork on it. And then somebody decides to hook that phone up and they find out that there's been orders sent from that phone to attack or kill somebody or make a drug drop or uh, have an escape. Guess what? That evidence is out. So treat this evidence stuff seriously. Um, think about it. Create that unbroken chain. All right. And uh, just be sure to do a good job and stay safe out there. Hope you guys all like this video. Hope we get some good comments on it and stuff. And those of you that are, um, you know, experts in this realm that have done a whole lot of crime scene preservation and done a whole lot of evidence collection, let's chime in and uh, put some extra stuff out there. Stuff that I don't have time for in this video, stuff that I don't know about, stuff that you've been involved with that are really good stories about how not to screw this up or about how to save the day and win the case. Anyway, stay safe, everyone. Bye. Oh!